Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of Awkward Conversations. I am your host, Jody Sweeten, and I have some really wonderful guests today. Uh, we are here talking about preventing drug misuse among college students, which is obviously a really critical issue to talk about, but is not something that you should wait until your kids are going to college to talk about, and we're gonna talk about that today. So uh, I am very excited to be joined today by Rich Lucy, who is the Senior Prevention Program Manager of the Community Outreach and Prevention Support Section for the DEA. Welcome, Rich. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure thing. Glad to be here. Absolutely. And also joining us is Dr. Sally Lenowski, who is the Associate Dean of Students, Off-Campus Student Life and Community Engagement at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Sally, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it, Jody. And you guys may recognize her uh, from season one of Awkward Conversations. We have Seychelles Mizell with us here today. Hi, Seychelles. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you played Rosie in uh, our season one uh, of Awkward Conversations that people may remember you from, and you did such a great job. And Thank you are a recent college grad, so we are really excited to have you as a part of our conversation today. And of course, Amy McCarthy, our LCSW licensed clinical social worker from Boston Children's Hospital, who is here with us to give a professional uh, a standpoint from all of this that we're discussing today. So hi, Amy. Hi, I'm super excited to be back. Thanks so much. So uh, today's episode, we are talking about uh, preventing drug misuse among college students. Kids are going to be going back to school, going to be leaving for college. It's a huge transition period. Recently, college students were asked, what are the main reasons uh, for drug experimentation? And, I, and the first was the ease of drug availability. Uh, two was the lack of parental influence which I know is in, uh, a huge point. Uh, three, the normalization of drug use among peers. And four, the low perceived risk of harm from drug use. And those are um, four main reasons that are, are coming from a poll of, of young people, uh, college students themselves. So um, since we have a college student here, I would love to hear from you on any of those four points. I mean, are those things that you identify with? Are those reasons? I've gone to college in two different parts of the country, and I noticed a, there, depending on the area, there was specific types of drugs that were more normalized than others because everyone would either be buying it or selling it or knew where to buy or sell it. And, you know, since, like you said, there are no parents around, a lot of people might have not experimented in high school. So then they feel like their freshman year is the time to try things that they hadn't done before. So I did notice that. Also, with the normalization is a lot of, I don't want to use, I don't want to say peer pressure, but a lot of, well, they're doing it, so might as well. It's kind of that mindset. Like, I might as well just try it because they are. Right. And I mean, I, th I think, you know, as parents uh, and people, we'd also like to think that, you know, peer pressure is something that younger kids deal with, or maybe high school, and once you're out of that, like, everyone's sort of more adult about it. And we all face peer pressure, you know, amongst, uh, even as adults. Even when you're older, when you're 18 and able to make those decisions for the first time, oftentimes those inf those decisions are heavily influenced by the people around you. Um, now, where, what were the two places that you went to college at Seychelles that you noticed sort of a difference? In the, the Midwest and then Southern California. So I noticed in the Midwest, okay. in the Midwest, it was easier to buy alcohol when you were underage because it was just kind of given out. And then going to Southern California, you have like the, the party scene environment, which is coming into the college environment so the two clashing together is mm -hmm. like well they're all doing it and we're here so we might as well just try it dr lenowski what do you notice uh when when kids are coming in their freshman year um that has a huge impact on whether or not they get involved uh in either drug use or alcohol use and whether it be whether it potentially turns into uh, abuse I think one of the things we notice when students are arriving on campus is that excitement for this is all new and everybody is like me and I want to fit in, I want to make friends, I want to be popular, and I kind of want to find my group quickly. And so sometimes that can lead students to try to wander to look for parties or look for social environments where they think they're going to have that full-on college experience. Um, and so they may actually, um, you know, go off campus or go into um, situations where there's more risk than they're accustomed to. 
because they have an expectation that this is college and it's going to be the big time. On the flip side, um, we see a lot of students who really don't want to be part of the party scene. They come to campus because they, they want to study, they want to do well, they're interested in sports, they may be athletes. And so they don't, they don't pay much attention to it. They just jump in 100% with what is the university going to offer for me. Rich, I know you do a lot of community outreach too, um, obviously in your, in your position with the, the DEA. Do you find that this is an age that people are introduced to a lot of new experiences and a lot of new drugs that maybe they haven't been before, particularly when going to a larger college campus or something outside of maybe their hometown? Yeah, so it's interesting the, the four reasons that students mentioned uh, because they align really well with the work that, that I do around the country, that Sally does around the country and on her campus. So, you know, lack of parental influence, for example, we know that for college students, and, you know, maybe we'll talk about the pandemic effect later, because I don't think we can ignore that that happened. Um, but the first six weeks on campus are typically the most at-risk time for college students, especially if they're, you know, for the first time away from home. They're no longer under you know, any form of parental influence. Um, so, you know, that is a, a very risky period of time. The normalization issue as well. So I don't want to get all statistics on us, but I, I do have a couple that I want to mention. So there are a couple of national studies that we always uh, keep our eye on. And for marijuana use, the perceived risk of harm for 18 to 22 year olds is only at 21%. That means 21% of 18 to 22 year olds, of which college students are a big chunk, only 21% see any risk in using marijuana. And that's the lowest that's been in almost four decades. What we know in prevention is when that perceived risk of harm goes down, the usage rate tends to go up. So we shouldn't be surprised when we find out that about one in 12 college students are using marijuana on a daily or a near daily basis. So, and just on the other two issues that came up, in prevention, we're always looking at easy access, easy availability, and changing norms. And if the norm within the family, within the school, or within the community is high risk use, that's a hard norm to break. It takes a, a long time to change that norm, but that all of those things align very much with the work that we do in prevention. And, you know, I wonder if with the rise in uh, fake and, and counterfeit uh, medication that's out there that's flooding the market, that we're seeing, you know, uh, increases in uh, fentanyl, accidental overdoses and things like that, has the perceived risk of harm uh, of young college students jumped up in response to some of that going on? I mean, have we seen that they're a little more wary of those sorts of things? Yeah, interestingly, in both the lower grades, so there's another part of that study that looks at 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, as well as college students, the perceived risk of harm for things like cocaine, heroin, those are still high. I mean, it's it's when you get to, to like marijuana, for instance, that you run into that issue. I'm glad you brought up the issue of fake pills because that's why DEA, we started a new awareness campaign last fall called One Pill Can Kill because of this huge influx in fentanyl that is being pressed into these fake pills. Rich, I'm really glad you bring up, uh, you know, the, the, the statement of one pill can kill. We actually are going to do uh, an episode later on uh, in our series here uh, talking about that because it is it's such a huge problem. And it's so scary right now um, that it really is one pill, one, you know, one of anything that uh, you can have it accidentally. So I, I know that that's something that we really want to focus on, but I'm glad that we brought it up here. And unfortunately, you mentioned, um, we talk about opioid misuse, significant epidemic in our country. But as, as Sally will attest, being actually on a college campus, be interesting to hear what Seychellis may have to say on that, but the prescription drug class most misused by college students are uh, the non-medical use of prescription stimulants. And it's because they think that if I take you know, a Ritalin, an Adderall, it's going to get me a better grade. And you know what? If you've been diagnosed legitimately those pills, absolutely it's going to help you with your concentration and focus. If you're looking to take those because you think it's going to get you from a, a B to an A, a C to a B, there's no research to indicate that that is true. So unfortunately, students 
college students are looking to score whatever these prescription stimulants they can. Again, part of this misguided belief. So they're getting them from their friends, teammates, coworkers. They have no idea where those drugs are coming from. And that's where you run into the issue of fake pills, counterfeit pills pressed with fentanyl. And now we end up with the overdose, fatal and non-fatal overdoses that we are seeing across the country. So I'm glad you brought that up. Amy, I wanted to talk to you also. Um, you know, I know we're talking about college students and sort of kids that are young people, young adults that are getting ready to leave out of the house or are on their way to college in the beginning. Um, when should parents start thinking about this? And I'm, I have a feeling it's a lot sooner than like the summer before your kids go to college. Uh, you know, when should parents start thinking about having some of these discussions? with? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a super important thing for us to talk about. And um, I think that parents can be so anxious around these types of conversations too. Like, did I say enough? Did I do enough? And I think it's a, you know, it's a good opportunity to remind parents that, you know, some of these things are tied to so many conversations that they're going to be having with their children throughout kind of their child development. And so, um, so just remember and give yourself credit where credit is due, you know, when it comes to the fact, you know, that, that you've probably already started some of these conversations in, in some ways. If you're listening today and you're thinking, oh my goodness, like, wait a second, there's so much more for me to discuss. You know, I would say <clears throat> any time is the right time. So if you haven't had it, and even if your child is out of college and you're concerned about these things, if there's still time to have these conversations. But when I think about how soon and how early uh, families are having conversations with their children about college in general these days, you know, as early as like the end of elementary school and middle school and like preparing for that. Um, so I think I think as you kind of come into middle school and you're just starting to talk about substances, perhaps in general and, you know, use and availability and things like that, um, you know, I think that, that that's a great time to, to also bring in, you know, let's think about how this will affect your future. And if college is, is part of your child's kind of path for the future, then bringing that right into it um, kind of all together. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity to remind children that, and, and young adults and adolescents, depending on their age, that also onset of substance use can also put them at risk for kind of being derailed from their path if college is the path that they're looking for. So I think that's a really great opportunity and great time to bring bring this into the fold. Got it. So sort of, you know, it's never too early. It's never too late. You, as long as you you have these conversations, you're, you know, one of the things is really having a relationship and an open, honest dialogue with your kids, uh, which was what I loved about what we talked about with Awkward Conversations last year is there is no, there's no perfect way to have these conversations. There's no easy way. There's no, you know, you're, you're never going to walk away and be like, that was the best conversation. You know, <laughs> just have them. Just start opening up those things because I think, um, you know, the more your kids feel that you are open to having them talk to you about it. I mean, I, I, I say, Shellis, what are some of the things that as you've grown up, um, that maybe your parents or p adults that you trusted in your life, what are some of the tips and conversations that maybe they've had? Or what were the ways that you um, gained some positive influence from the people in your life as you grew up having to deal with these situations? I did, I did notice that there was this constant, don't try to fit in, don't always, like the peer pressure, like don't do what everyone else is doing. Because I know when I went in as a freshman, it was like the greatest moment in the world when an upperclassman talked to you. So you have, so I just, just growing up with that, like reminder from my parents, like be yourself. Don't think you have to do what your friends are doing or what someone older is doing. And then when you get into college and the older people are more uh, more ahead, you are like battling with yourself to not fit in and just stick with where you are. So that's like, it goes by person by person. It's, it's definitely hard because you do want friends. You do want the social life. So I know like that was a huge reminder from my parents growing up there. Just being yourself and yeah. really honoring who you are and, right. and living fully in that. I love that. And that's, I mean, that's such a, a huge message that parents are always trying to give their kids. And it's nice to hear that, that uh, kids hear us, <laughs> you know? And, and I think parents also need to remember that too. Like, even if you think your kids are tuning you out, even if you think these conversations aren't having an effect, the fact that you are opening that door and that you're repeatedly bringing it up or laying things out on the table to open up these conversations, that's one of the most important things I think that parents uh, can really do. 
Saving lives means staying informed. Knowing the dangers of using counterfeit prescription pills can help those you care about and keep our community safe. As a parent, educator, neighbor, or friend, we all play a role in building safe and healthy futures for ourselves and our loved ones. Do your part. Take the first step today. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com to access education, prevention, and treatment resources. Counterfeit prescription pills laced with fentanyl are deadly. Be their protector. Be informed. Visit GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. Being a a dean of students on campus, what are some of the things that... um, incoming freshmen maybe can do in like what are some of the ways that they can get involved what are some of the ways that they can um jump into campus life without having to rely on the party scene as the only way to meet people and make friends oh great um well one of the things is that campuses are really designed to welcome students so during the first several weeks of a semester there are tons of things to partake in So part of it is, you know, talking with your resident assistant in your residence hall, looking at the social media, because we know people don't really look at posters anymore, but checking out, checking out the social media to find out when's the involvement fair, when's the activities expo, when is the rec center open, when can I go learn about campus jobs, and so There will be all sorts of events with barbecues and students and tables and opportunities where we are opening our doors to welcome you here. We're excited you're here. We want to see you. So um, getting outside of your room, making making a trek across campus, go exploring the student union and knocking on doors, looking around. Take your eyes of a tourist into this new environment and look around and see what you're like, oh, if I played soccer in high school and I'm not on the, you know, I'm not a D1 school, I'm maybe not going to play soccer. Hey, there's intramurals. Let me find out when that is, because then you'll find something right away. I know sometimes that can be really key too, is being like, okay, what are the things that you want? What are, what is your schedule going to look like? Are you going to have a job? Are you going to have, you know, intramurals? Are you going to have tutoring? What are those things? And really helping put those into place, I think, with your kids before they get to campus. Yeah, I think a lot of times for students and parents, there's a lot of focus on your academic transcript and getting the perfect resume, right? So that I wanna make sure I have all these educational opportunities and internships and co-ops and jobs and things like that. But you also wanna make sure that you're taking care of your mental health scorecard, right? So what are the things that make me happy, that make me feel fulfilled, that make me feel challenged and relaxed and supported? Um, and making sure that you are seeking those out as well so that you're well-rounded um, and have you know, a good social life in addition to your academic success. And make sure and join us for our next episode. Coming up on the next episode of Awkward Conversations. I know I struggled immensely. Um, my, my first semester of college uh, was a really rough time of my life. This counseling centers are a huge aspect of, of college life. And campuses around the country, including at UMass Amherst, have tremendous services in place for those students who choose to ignore the law. For, for families, embracing technology is really a great way to stay in touch with your, with your students. When I was getting into school, it started to become really popular for YouTube vlogs of students to document like what their rooms look like, what the school looks like. We've got some great perspectives here, and um, I think it all comes down to communication, communication, and communication. Make sure to check out GetSmartAboutDrugs.com. Parents, caregivers, you can find so many resources of great information there about how to talk to your kids and make these conversations a little less awkward. A huge thank you to the Elks DAP, which is the largest all-volunteer nationwide drug awareness program, and also a huge thanks to the DEA for their outreach program and for making this possible. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Awkward Conversation series are solely those of the individuals, speakers, commentators, experts, and or hosts involved, and do not necessarily reflect nor represent those of the production, associates, or broadcaster, or any of its employees. Production is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the series available for viewing. The primary purpose of this series is to educate and inform. This series does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This series is available for private, non-commercial, commercial use only. The production, broadcaster, or its channel cannot be held accountable for all or any views expressed during this program.